We live in an age that is unlike any other age in American history, where people are not sure anymore that there is a God. They're, that they're, they're, they think that the Bible has lots and lots of contradictions in it, which it does not. And people think that the Bible is simply a bunch of Jewish fairy tales, and it is no longer considered to be, by so many millions of people today, the inspired Word of God. Hi, I'm Keith Slough from Ambassador Christian College in Kannapolis. Is the Bible really true? Now, many of you listening to this program are listening on a Christian station, and many of you, if you're listening on a Christian station, you go to church and you've accepted it. But do you simply believe the Bible on faith? Do you take the Bible on faith, or do you actually know that you know it really is the Word of God? Now, a famous evangelist Billy Graham said a number of times in his uh, ministry, and I've heard probably all of his sermons, um, of, certainly since the, the 60s on or 70s on, I've heard probably every single sermon he gave, but he said that he wasn't sure and he had some questions back when he went to seminary, and so he said, I just decided to take it by faith. He made the right decision to take it by faith, to, to believe the Bible, but do you know that even the Apostle Paul said we must prove all things? A lot of you haven't done that. You haven't proved it. You've taken what somebody told you. Your mother told you it was true. Your grandmother told you. Your pastor tells you. You've got friends that go to church and they believe it. So you, well, you kind of sort of believe it too. You know, many years ago, I was challenged to prove all things. Paul said, prove all things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, prove all things. And I decided I would do that very thing. I wanted to know for sure if I could prove the Bible. Now, I've got an article I'd like to send you absolutely free of charge and no request for money. We're not, we're not trying to sell it to you. I'd like to give it away. We'll mail it to your house. And uh, all you got to do is call up. It won't even cost you a stamp. Call up the number I'll give you here in just a few moments, and you can get this article on the proof of the Bible. Some people say, well, if you're a Christian, you don't need to prove it. But it was to Christians, members of God's church, members of the body of Christ, to whom Paul said these words, prove all things. He's not talking to the heathen. He's not talking to the non-Christian. He's talking to born-again Christians, and he says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. One of the things you must prove, if you're going to be a, a Christian who practices what the Bible teaches, if you're going to be a person who obeys the Word of God, you must prove even the Bible is true. You've got to do what the Bible says. Now, I started at the very beginning proving there was a God, and on this radio broadcast over many years now, over 30 years, I have proved numerous times, and also on television and in church and in the classroom as well, the scientific proof for the existence of God. One of our uh, degree programs uh, features the, uh, a, a course called Astrophysics and Creation. And I teach the class, Astrophysics is a hobby of mine, where I go back and I show from, uh, the, from actual scientific proof that the universe had an origin. It has not always existed. Now, how did it come into existence? And did it come into to existence very gradually through a process of evolution? No. It was created in a very tiny fra fraction of a second, a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. I believe uh, the way you pronounce it is, I heard Dr. Hugh Ross, who is a, uh, an astrophysicist, he pronounced it this way. The fraction of a second is one ten millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Now, I don't know how the mathematicians come up with that, but they do. And, and he's a, in fact, Hugh Ross himself became a Christian. I don't know how long he's been a Christian, but he's an astrophysicist. And he knows that the universe was created. And so that shows there had to be a creator. The law of biogenesis shows there had to be a, a creator who made the first life and so on and so on and so on. I won't go into that now. Well, is the Bible really true? Now, I talked to you on one program recently about the, uh, the Hindu scriptures and the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, and so on. I've got scriptures from the Egyptian scriptures, the Book of the Dead, for example, the Tibetan scriptures. I've got the Babylonian scriptures. I've got the entire Koran, Zoroastrian scriptures, Shintoism, Taoism. Uh, I've got scriptures from just about, I think, every single major religion of the world. And the Bible is the only one that actually claims inspiration. That doesn't make it so. However, 
through fulfilled prophecy, you can show that it really is true. Now, Christians need this too, not just non-Christians. You who, are, who go to church, you need to be able to prove the Bible is true. After all, somebody comes up to you and says, well, I'm not a Christian. I think the Bible's loaded with contradictions. It was all put together like a patchwork quilt kind of a thing, and people slapped it together, and it probably just has a few nicey-nice little uh, poems and uh, psalms to kind of, you know, give you something to think about when you're praying, I guess, or to make you feel better, or for your devotional time. But it really has no significance for my life. It doesn't really mean anything to me. Well, if I'm going to read something that's going to inspire me emotionally, well, I could read Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Epictetus, Eratus, Cleanthes. I could read all any number of uh, poets. I could read modern-day poets like E.E. E. Cummings and, and uh, even Edgar Allan Poe. He was a pretty good poet. Well, some of his poetry was good. Some of it was lousy. But, uh, and I've read his poems. But, you see, people put the Bible on the same level as some of these man-made, uninspired books. The Bible is different. The Holy Bible has been absolutely proved to be the inspired, supernaturally created, supernaturally written Word of God. Now, here's the telephone number you can call if you'd like to get this article. It's only 12 pages, but it's chocked full of information. You can read it in one sitting. And by the way, if you would like to make a copy of it and give one to your pastor, you can call me and get permission for that. And we can allow you to make that uh, to make some copies to give to your pastor uh, and maybe some of the people in your church, some of the leaders in your church perhaps, because we would like for everybody to know about this. Now, here's the telephone number to call. If you would like to get this article, The Proof of the Bible, remember, even the Bible itself says prove all things. The number is 704, area code, 938-6415. And uh, you'll get a you know uh, uh, voice. You'll be able to leave a voicemail. So spell out your street address. Make sure we have your zip code. It's seven zero four nine three eight sixty four fifteen. And I'll give you that number again at the close of the program. The Bible predicts what's going to happen in the future, not just our future. It predicted it for centuries. And we've seen a record of how these prophets got it right, not just once in a while, but 100% of the time. Now, what does the Scripture say is going to happen in our future? What's going to happen to us? Well, people wonder about, you know, all the pestilences and disease epidemics that you see around the world. There's flu every year, and then the coronavirus and all this mess. Are we living in the last days? Is it possible that the Bible predicted these things in advance. You ought to read Matthew 24, the Olivet Prophecy, where Jesus predicted that there would be pestilence. They asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And the term world there in Greek is aeon, meaning age, not the end of the earth. The world is never coming to an end. The age we live in will be terminated at the second coming of Jesus, and then he sets up a new well, I hate to use the term new age because the occultists use that term, but an age that is entirely different than the age we live in, where Christ himself rules through his law. The Ten Commandments will be universal. The statutes and the judgments of God will be implemented, and world peace will come, not immediately, but they will gradually lay down their arms. The Bible says they'll turn their swords, a sword is a biblical symbol for weaponry, even though we don't use real swords today, but that would represent our uh, arsenal of weapons. They will turn their swords into plowshares. Now, how do you take a sword and turn it into a plowshare? Well, think about these massive, huge, great big tanks uh, that not only does America have, but they have them in Europe. Russia has the largest tank factory in the world because American tax, do tax dollars paid for it under a detente when Richard Nixon sent millions of dollars over there to build them the Kama River Truck Factory, which, of course, they use that to build tanks in. So they've got the world's largest tank factory and American tax dollars paid for it. That's another story in itself. So what will happen to all the tanks that have been made? Well, they'd make a great tractor, go out in the field and put a plow behind one of those things and plow a field with an old tank. So God is going to turn our weaponry into... Uh, implements of agriculture. 
And guess what? India will start e eating their cows. Do you know that, and this has been a statistic for years, do you know that the nation of India has more cattle than the United States of America? They've got all that cattle because they won't eat the cows. Their religion teaches them that they shouldn't eat animals because it might be uh, one of their ancestors. The Bible says when a man dies, he's dead until the judgment, and then he'll be resurrected. It says it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 in your New Testament. So people don't come back as a cow, neither are they reincarnated as uh, some child who comes along later, maybe even in your own lineage. Who was it? Uh, Shirley MacLaine. She said that uh, her kids, she said, if you misbehave, I'll come back and be your kids and I'll give you uh, what you've been giving me. I'll give you what for. Well, she was probably joking. I uh, hope she was. I don't know. With Shirley MacLaine, who knows? But but no, you, you, you're never going to be reincarnated and come back as another human being. I met a Christian guy, nice fellow, who believed in that. But the Bible teaches it is appointed unto man once to die, and then you get judged. So the idea that you're going to be born again and again and again and again and again. You come back as somebody else. In fact, this fellow told me, he said, Keith, you might have been a, uh, you might have had several past lives. He said, you might have even been a woman in a past life. Well, that didn't set too well with me. Now, ladies, don't write me a nasty letter. Believe me, I, I like women just fine. I just don't want to be one. Never have been one. I'm never going to be one. But uh, if, if reincarnation was true, I'd come back as a nun, I guess. But um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get you to understand is the Bible talks about the last days, and it does talk about what happens when you die. It does talk about the second coming of Jesus. It does talk about the fact that we will turn our, our uh, weapon, weapons into agricultural uh, means so that we can keep this planet going. The Bible says that, that all nations will live in peace, not initially because there's going to be a Russian invasion and things like that that happens, by the way, not before, but after the coming of Christ. And India will learn to eat its cows. Guess what? The people who are starving in India are going to have plenty of food to eat. God has blessed India with so much food. And yet, there are people standing along the sidelines saying, in a world such as this is, how can I believe in God? After all, if God is a God of love, why does he allow people in India to starve? Listen, don't be stupid. God has blessed India with so much food. Every one of them could be overweight and, and, and fat. And I mean, fat from just eating too much. They've got so much food. Do you know that this is a pretty old statistic too, but I haven't heard this changed, that 50% of the grain that America sends over there to feed those people are eaten by rats and they won't do a thing to keep the rat population down because they think those rats might be their ancestors. If you could change their religion, you could bless the people of India. If you could just change their religion, that's all it would take. If you want to solve the Middle East crisis, all you got to do is change the religion of the Arabs and the Persians, who are now Iranians, and the Egyptians. Change their religion, and you'd bring peace to the Middle East. Change the religion of India, and people would not be starving to death. You know, religion, while the Bible is religious and God is religious, but religion when it's perverted and corrupted, has become one of the greatest enemies of civilization. Now, I'm not picking on, on religious people. I happen to be one. But what I mean is that you take pagan religion and heathen religion that's been corrupted, where the people are deceived by Satan the devil. It is a horrible, horrible thing. The reason that so many hundreds of thousands of people over the years have starved to death in India is because they won't eat the food God gives them. The people, the, the reason we have so many people in the Middle East that are scared at night and afraid that the bombs are going to fall on them is because of the religion of Islam. It's not political. The news media seems to miss the whole purpose, the whole reason for this uh, Arab-Israeli impasse. And what the problem is, is the fact that the, uh, the Arabs, some of them descended from Ishmael, and they'll tell you that, wanted to have the promised land, but instead God gave it to Isaac, and the Jews are descended from Isaac, and so God said it's their land. It's not the Arabs' land. It does not belong to the Arabs. It never did. But it belongs 
to the Jewish people and also all the other tribes of Israel as well. God gave them that land. And here's what the Bible tells us. When Christ returns, Israel will be brought back into the land because the vast majority of the Israelites are still scattered all over the world. God knows where they are. I just read today in the book of Amos where it says that, that after they were scattered, God would not lose one grain among them. In other words, He knows where all the Israelites are today, all the 12 tribes. And God is going to bring them back into the land. Technically, Christ will do that. And their borders will be from the river of Egypt, which includes, that would include the Sinai Peninsula, all the way to the river Euphrates. That's going to be their border which means that Jordan's going to lose their land. I mean, it's going all the way to the Euphrates River. And probably, it, we don't know how far south it goes, but it, it possibly even takes up the vast majority of what is called Arabia. I mean, this is what God said He wanted Abraham's descendants to have through, through Isaac. But they don't have today. Today they have a little tiny itty-bitty piece of land that's only about 200 miles north and south. Only about 200 miles north and south. And east and west, it's really, really tiny. It's something like, I, I think, something like maybe less than 50 miles. It's very, very tiny. And, so, and, then, and, and then the Arabs want to take, the Palestinians want to take part of that away from them. Well, one day, all of the tribes of Israel are, will be brought back into the land. They're going to have it all. The Bible made these predictions. I'll tell you something else, too, that you might be interested in. The Bible says that in the last days there will be a temple standing in Jerusalem and animal sacrifices are going to be offered again. That's in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. It's also in 2 Thessalonians 2 where it talks about there will be a temple standing and the son of perdition, the man of sin, what evangelicals call the Antichrist, will walk right into that temple and claim to be God. Can you imagine any person being so bold and so boastful and so conceited, not to mention being a massive liar, to have the audacity to say he is God, and yet the Antichrist will do that? You ought to get this article on the proof of the Bible. Is it really true? And if it is, then you can go to the Bible and find out what our future holds. Let me tell you something. America is in trouble. Oh, yeah. America is in trouble. One of the reasons that God destroyed the Jewish nation, the nation of Judah, the kingdom of Judah it was called, is because Manasseh shed much innocent blood. Manasseh was the king. He was the son of Hezekiah, who was a righteous king. But then Manasseh turned out to be a spoiled brat, and uh, he ruled for 55 years in Judah. He never ruled Israel, but he did rule the Jewish people. And he was so evil, and of course the people went along with it, that he shed much innocent blood. And the people supported it. Our Supreme Court says it's okay to kill babies. If you don't want them, just kill them. And millions of Americans support it. You know how many, you know how many people voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016? 63 million Americans, which means that at least that many Americans are pro-abortion. You think for one moment... And we've got Christians, the hypocrites, who will vote for pro-abortion candidates, know what they stand for, and will still vote for them. People say, yeah, but I don't like the other guy who's running. That's fine, then stay home. Don't vote at all. But if you're going to vote, don't vote pro-abortion, pro-same-sex marriage. I'm telling you, the judgment of God is on this nation. And I don't know when it's going to fall, but it's on this nation. And I've been telling people this for over 30 years on this radio program that they need to get right with God because I'm telling you there will be judgment on this nation. Let me tell you this. The next world war will not just be in Germany or Japan. It's going to be right over here. And with atomic bombs, and not only do we have them, but France has them, England has them, Pakistan apparently does. China, we know, has the atomic bomb. Russia has the atomic bomb. Don't think for one moment that the next World War America is going to win it. The judgment of God is on this nation. I'm not setting dates, and I can't say when and how, but I'm telling you right now, if you're not a born-again Christian now, you better become one. And how do you do that? You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? You won't do what I say. That's in Luke 6, 46, if you want to look it up. We have to obey Him or He's not our Lord. Getting up out of your seat at an evangelistic meeting and going forward and saying, okay, I receive you as Lord, is not enough if you don't actually obey Jesus Christ. 
America has turned its back on God officially. When prayer was thrown out of the school, back in 1962, I think it was, when prayer was thrown out of the schools, where were the protests? Where were all the marches? Where were all the Christians protesting, going to Washington, D.C. and saying, uh-uh, we're not going to accept that? The churches were quiet. They didn't say much, if anything, at that time. And then, of course, in 1973, just 10 years later, then, or 10, 11 years later, the Supreme Court says it's okay now to kill babies. That was in January in 1973. Now, where were all the marches for, from the Christians there? And they let that happen. Now the Supreme Court says it's okay for men to get married and shack up and live in the same bed in, 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 the, in the most filthy human relationship you could imagine. And they say, that's fine, that's okay, well, all right, fine. Maybe the, maybe the Supreme Court shouldn't be dictating to the church, but let me tell you what is really the problem. The churches of our country are beginning to absorb, if they haven't already, the culture around them. We now have churches that openly accept practicing homosexuals and say it's okay. What about Leviticus chapter 18? What about Leviticus chapter 20? What about uh, Galatians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 5? What about 1 Corinthians 6? Uh, what about uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, which is very explicit? Well, it's almost like these churches don't even own a Bible. Or if they do, they haven't proved it to be the Word of God, so therefore they just ignore it. Let me tell you something. The Apostle Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words. He said, Judgment must first begin at the house of God. Now, the house of God, according to 1 Timothy 3, 15, is the church. The church is the house of God, not the building, the people. Judgment will first of all fall on the churches because the churches are supposed to be leading this nation back to God. Instead, we've got denominations now that actually not only approve of homosexual marriage, but they're even ordaining practicing homosexuals to be their pastors now, I'm not talking about somebody who was a sinner way back 20, 25, 30 years ago, and he's been truly, truly saved, and now he's changed. I'm not talking about a person who has repented. The Bible says all have sinned. But a practicing homosexual, and you, you ordain him to be the pastor of your church and to be setting a good example for your children? That practicing homosexual is going to set a good example for your little boy, is he? Would you trust him going to the pastor's house? Would you trust your kid going to his house? What in the world is wrong with our churches? Well, I can tell you from Scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul said, In the last days there will be a falling away, meaning a falling away from the truth. Now, the Greek word, 400 years ago, the, the British people didn't understand that word, but today it's a word that's now in the English language. You know what the Greek word for falling away is? It's the word apostasy. And we see that apostasy is not in the nation as much as it's in the church. Apostasy means to fall from the truth, to forsake the truth. Now, the churches are supposed to have it. Aren't the churches supposed to have Jesus? And didn't Jesus say, I am the way and the truth and the life, John 14, 6? So they're, they're falling away from Jesus. Jesus is Lord, he's supposed to be, or you're not a Christian. You don't just receive Him as Savior. You've got to receive Him as Lord. And if you haven't done that, you're not a Christian. Does that make sense to you? Some people say, oh, get up out of your seat and come forward and receive Him as Savior. Fine, I'll, I'll accept Him as Savior, but just not going to do what He says. And Jesus said, well, why do you call me Lord? So many people call Him the good Lord. The good Lord this and the good Lord that. And, you know, and, and they sound so religious. And they may be genuinely sincere. But Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you do not the things which I say. Luke chapter 6. Look it up. The article I have here on the proof of the Bible will set you straight because you will then open up the Bible and realize this is the inspired word of Almighty God. And when you understand that, when you begin to understand that this Bible is God's word, then you can start living by it and really doing what it says. You know where I would recommend you start? If you're not a Christian, start in the Gospel of John, by all means. But if you already are a Christian, you ought to start in uh, the 20th chapter of Exodus, the Ten Commandments. Study the Ten Commandments. Some of you can't even quote them. Don't just read them. Study them. 
2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And God's law is truth. Psalm 119, verse 142 says that the law of God is truth. So study the truth. Study the Ten Commandments. Now, Joshua 1, 8 says, not only do we read the law, we're to meditate in God's law day and night. And, and it also says that you may prosper in your ways. Do you want to prosper? Study God's law and live by it. Jesus said man is to live by every word of God. Well, I'm out of time on this broadcast. Tell your friends where to hear this radio program. It's different. I'm not preaching to you from a church. I've got a microphone in front of me and I'm sitting here at my desk and I'm giving you God's word right here. And I'm talking to so many of you and uh, many, many hundreds and hopefully thousands of people will hear this radio broadcast. And all you've got to do, if you'd like to get that article, just pick up the telephone and call me and get your Christian life started right. It's hard to be a Christian and you're not 100% sure that the Bible's even true. The telephone number to get that free article, there's no request for money and we do not give your name to anybody else. The telephone number is area code 704. The number is 938-6415. One more time, 704-938-6415. Spell out your street address. You'll get an answering machine. Make sure we have your name and your zip code and suite number if there is one. Until next time, from Ambassador Christian College, this has been Keith Slough.